Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to Gigabit Britain for the many, not the few. Uh, I should say, first of all, that Damien Collins is uh, only going to be able to come at uh, two o'clock, so uh, but we'll start uh, now on time. Uh, on my far left, uh, Mark Collins will, will start. Uh, he has been in the te telecoms industry for over 20 years. He was the founder of Ecuador Consulting, a firm specialising in the development of early stage telecoms companies. Uh, and he is now um, at City Fibre, where he was a uh, founding partner. Paul Morris uh, is the head of government affairs at Vodafone. He is responsible for Vodafone uh, within Westminster and Whitehall in regards to key policy and legislative challenges facing the company. Uh, I should also thank Vodafone and Paul for sponsoring this event. Sarah Lee is the head of policy at the Countryside Alliance, obviously where she has been a leading campaigner defending the rights of rural Britain and has a particular interest in the whole question of internet access. And Damien Collins, when he arrives, has been the MP for Folkestone and High since 2010 and he is chairman of the uh, Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee, uh, which obviously has the uh, responsibility for overseeing uh, uh, international broadband connections. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to start, then um, we'll take contributions from each member of the panel and then we'll have questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everyone. Mark Collins from uh, uh, City Fibre. Um, uh, for those who don't know City Fibre, we're a uh, uh, a builder of full fibre infrastructure across the, uh, the UK, focusing in mid-sized towns and cities outside of London. Currently we have a presence in 42 towns and cities with an, a, a, a plan to reach a coverage of 100 towns and cities with full fibre infrastructure um, over the next uh, three to four years. Um, and with that, uh, an ability to connect everybody within um, those towns and cities, that's businesses, it's the public sector, it's through to residents, it's through to the connectivity for mobile operators for better 4G and 5G coverage, it's an infrastructure, a new modern digital infrastructure with the ability to power true gigabit capable services. Now, you may know us as uh, the builder of gigabit cities, um, uh, that's how we like to think about city fibre in terms of building and bringing gigabit speed connectivity uh, to the reach of everybody, whether that's through fixed connections or ultimately through kind of wireless connections as well. Um, and obviously the title of today's uh, session here, which is kind of Gigabit Britain for the many and not the few. So how do we get as a, uh, an industry gigabit speed connectivity to as many people as we can? Now, uh, there's been lots of debate, and I was here at the, the event um, uh, at conference last year, and involved in a, in a uh, panel session called, you know, um, Britain's Broken Broadband. Um, and if you look at what's happened over the past 12 months, it's quite interesting to see how much policy change has actually happened in the past 12 months. So we have a government now which has, you know, stepped up to um, the, if you like, the challenge in setting an ambition, uh, which was um, reaffirmed in the Conservative Party conference for. Uh, new competitive fibre spine networks in no less than 100 towns and cities with the uh, need for full fibre connectivity to be delivered to no less than 10 million premises by 2025 and policies to put the country on a path to national coverage of full fibre over the next decade. So the government's clearly set an aspiration for which the industry needs to respond. And I think in some ways we're seeing that response from industry. Um, so whether that's in um, uh, the incumbent operators, um, open reach now, having gone through its kind of separation, uh, or going through its separation process, legal separation process from BT Group, um, is consulting with industry on how it can step up to deliver uh, full fibre connectivity, gigabit capable connectivity to no less than 10 million premises. Um, <coughs> and the alternative sector, the competitors to um, open reach and other infrastructure builders as well, substantial uh, degrees of investment coming in uh, to companies like ourselves, to giga clear in rural communities, companies like hyper optic, so on. If you take the collective aspirations of uh, private companies that are investing or seeking to invest over the next uh, period in gigabit capable full fibre 
broadband, the pledges add up, and if I add in the, the uh, open reach kind of aspiration for its 10 million um, premises, if you add them all together, you come to over 20 million premises, actually about 24 million uh, premises, which the private sector is saying that under the right policy environment and the right regulatory environment, that that investment can come in um, over the next five to 10, maybe 15 years at a stretch but could deliver 80 to 85, maybe up to 90% for fibre connectivity across the UK. So the question I think we have on a policy sense is how to encourage the industry to collaborate to achieve that. Um, uh, if there is a, uh, an opportunity for investment in a infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, which on one case has very compelling business case because it's utility-like infrastructure which will be there and be utilised for the long term, but the, but the short-term challenges of how to make the business case work and pay back in a sensible time frame for investors when they have other investment decisions they could make is actually how do we come together and collaborate to do that. And we see um, the market broadly dividing into, into three areas. There's going to be the um, the rural areas, the hardest to reach rural areas, which today are already seeing some investments in full fibre connectivity. Companies like TrueSpeed, GigaClear in particular, which is one of the larger providers now, stepping up to provide uh, full fibre connectivity into rural Britain. Um, so that's a good thing. And that's been done in a mixture of, of, of full commercial projects and some um, state subsidised projects under the VDUK programme. But it's clear that there's an opportunity for a greater degree of fibre in rural areas, connectivity <coughs> in rural areas. Um, the risks, though, is that when you look at the commercial aspects of the market, which is broadly estimated about 20 so million, is do uh, all commercial investors invest, uh, that's ourselves, Open Rich, High Property, and others invest into the same towns and cities and create a lot of duplication of investment in the same places, or do we try to look at a model which spreads that investment to get to the 20 million or so premises that could be covered? Um, and I think that's a key, uh, uh, if you like, challenging uh, policy kind of ask as to how do you create collaboration within the industry to ensure that investment is, uh, gives to the greatest geographic coverage and therefore through the greatest geographic coverage um, the ability for more towns, more cities, more villages to participate in a modern digital infrastructure which is gigabit capable. Um, so I think in that sense, we're looking for um, uh, collaboration within the industry itself, greater degrees of collaboration between those that are investing in industry in terms of making access to networks and infrastructure um, accessible to different parties so we can get, get the benefit of greater group of geographic coverage, a policy which encourages um, that environment and then the people that consume those infrastructures, the service providers, the mobile operators and so on, um, supporting the various business cases for the companies that are deploying and investing. I think that applies for us, it applies to Open Rich, and it applies to others. Building infrastructure requires customers and customers to use it, and the intermediary between the end customers and ourselves as infrastructure builders are the, are the major service providers that provide those services to their end users. So we all have to play our part in making that happen. Bringing those things together though, I think we do have a good opportunity over the next five, ten years to see a large proportion of the UK uh, delivered with full fibre connectivity and in doing so the ability to catch up with the rest of the world. We have to remember that we are a long way behind. Our starting point here is that we are a long way behind most other European countries and therefore we're in a kind of post-Brexit environment. Digital infrastructure, 80% of the, the UK's economy is service-based economy. Um, and if we want to uh, effectively take advantage of a service-based economy, then we need good access, reliable internet connectivity, which requires a good digital infrastructure that underpins it. But I think if we bring those things together, that can be achieved. Thank you. Paul? Uh, the danger of having two uh, network companies speaking up to each other is you have to try to adjust as you go along. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, no, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the opportunity, um, a little bit about where we are. Mark's covered that rather well. Um, uh, and, and just a little bit around, I think, where we've got to think about in terms of policy, because I know most people in this room are interested in politics and policy. Um, and before I hand over to uh, Councillor Lance to talk about rural challenge, which is, which is indeed, indeed a challenge. 
So, um, uh, why, why does this matter? Well, the key point is that uh, we firmly believe that the digital economy can drive growth in a post-Brexit Britain. Um, uh, but if we don't build the infrastructure to support that growth, it won't happen. So that's why it matters. I mean, if you look at the digital economy, uh, you know, the last figures, we are, you know, we're one of the leading in Europe. We've got, it's about 7.3% of, of the whole economy, which is about £118 billion. Pounds. That was in our 2014 stats. So obviously, it would have continued to grow since then, so it matters. Um, we, we recently produced a report, in fact last month, uh, with Matt Hancock in, in London, uh, and the report itself was looking at the opportunity uh, in those towns that are largely outside of the South East and uh, London, and we looked at 57 towns across the UK and found that they had massive digital potential. We looked at basically digital infrastructure skills and the digital economy. Uh, and, um, and what we found, and we, we coined it, you know, could we create digital super towns? But what we really found was actually with uh, small changes, um, you, know, you could see some real economic growth. And I think this is what Greg Clark has been talking about, which I think is there's things we could do very quickly to uh, increase growth and productivity, and there's things that will take a bit longer. To be honest, digital infrastructure will take that a bit longer, but there are some other things we can do as well. But it's all underpinned on this idea that without productivity, you cannot, um, you cannot deliver the digital economy. Um, so, I mean, the report itself that we produced, we recommended that um, we should uh, think about creating digital enterprise zones, and we would hope that within those, and that's really giving power, frankly, to local decision makers, be they, you know, it could be the metro mayors, it could be uh, local government, it could be devolved government. But the reality there is that we can then have uh, policy-friendly environments that can help push forward both on you know, digital skills, um, on, on, on different ways of rolling out infrastructure to some of the things that Mark's talked about. We need to think about doing things slightly differently, uh, but also on digital economy. So things like, you know, why don't we, I mean, I mean most big companies are paying uh, apprenticeship loans, for example. Why, why, why can't that be invested locally in digital skills? Uh, why can't uh, lo local decision makers make, make an environment that is friendly to investment within, uh, for, for digital infrastructure? So I think all of these things, we've got to start thinking differently if we, to, to sort of get us moving on, on, on this next generation of, of, um, of infrastructure investment. So basically it's the backbone. Um, uh, I always, I'll say this and I'm bound someone's going to say that in their place this doesn't work. I do understand that you, any of our customers in the room today will be the expert on our <laughs> network in their own area. So I'm willing to someone to sell me up and tell me where it's not working. But the truth is we have invested a lot of money and we have rolled out 4G now to 97% of the population. I hope you've noticed an improvement. I'm not saying it is perfect, but actually, you know, it's, it's come at quite a lot of work and a lot of investment. We've invested £2 billion over the last couple of years and we'll do something similar over the next couple. Uh, and, and 4G itself is um, it's not strictly the same, but it is a bit like switching from copper to fibre on 4G. Um, and, you know, if I look at, we did a test in London recently, we got 450, over 450 megabytes out of that network in London. You know, as a technology, it is pretty transformative. Um, but but um, clearly, you know, I'm not saying that everything's perfect, and I think one of the things we need to look at, which Mark has highlighted, is how we move on now with the broadband network and start building out this, this network, which actually isn't frankly new. It's been it's been built in other countries, which is this fibre to the premise or full fibre, full fibre network. And basically, that's the debate, really. I mean, you know, what do we do about copper, or do we invest in fibre? And what we've basically done up to this point is invested in a mix of copper and fibre. And our argument is that actually we've got to go that step further now and, uh, and invest only in fibre. And the reason for that is, is basically, um, you know, it, the good news is it's not like, you know, it's not like NHSIT, right? This is not brand new technology. It's being rolled out across the world in different places. Um, you know, we are behind in this, but it does work. It's much better than the, uh, the copper-based network. Um, uh, it's much more reliable. It has better latency. You're, you're almost you're almost unlikely to get your little you know little washer thing when you're trying to you're trying to watch your your, your on demand uh, sport or films. Uh, so it, it is much better, and I, I actually believe what we've done really is you know, and I'm, I mean I know BT and know Richard the room. They, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that it's a terrible network they've rolled out, but I think actually people are are frankly got used to you know semi good broadband. And their expectations are of semi good broadband, and we need to change that because then I think people will be willing to pay for it, which is the important thing. We need people to buy the product, otherwise, there's going to be no return on the investment. 
Um, if I give you a stat from, uh, we roll out Fiverr to Premise across Europe, and we just announced new investment in Germany. To, um, yesterday, I think it was in Portugal. Um, so we're doing it as a company. Uh, Spain's another example. We are doing it as a company across Europe. The key question and the question we say to ministers is why aren't we doing it here? They ask us and we tell them and we need to make an environment that make, makes that investment worthwhile and we're interested in all different sorts of models to do it. So that could be co-investment, sometimes it's direct build or we've, we've even bought some companies in other, com in other companies. So we're open to, open to options. In Spain we found that we had 50% fewer faults on, that, on our fibre to the premise network in comparison to the copper network run by the... Uh, the incumbent in Spain to the BT equivalent, so it actually does actually work. But if we look at, as Mark hinted at, if we look at where we are in terms of our competitors um, on fibre to the premise, we're, I mean, we, I mean, there's some good news coming, and I think that's right, but today we're around, you know, we're a bit over 2%, I think now, um, but the Western Europe average is 25%. So, you know, we need to get moving. I mean, the thing is, you know, we're doing these three years, I think, um, you know, and we've made progress, I think we have made progress, but it's a bit slow, and we need to try and speed that up a bit. Now, what people don't always understand, although apparently there's quite a few people who do understand it, recognising people in the room, uh, is that mobile is also heavily reliant on fibre, um, and uh, more and more so with 4G, where we need most of our miles now to be connected to fibre where possible. It will be absolutely essential for 5G. You cannot run 5G without fibre. So to think about this is not just about broadband, but it also is the backbone for mobile. So what needs to be done? Well, there's lots of things that need to be done. We've been having conversations with the government for you know, several years now, really around things like how do you, how do you make a policy environment that's suitable for rollout? I think planning reform, uh, property reform, where that's not helpful. You know, um, uh, can we use public sector assets, buildings and land? Um, so there's a number of areas that we've been working with them on that front, which is really how do you help rollout? But increasingly also, as Mark hinted at, what we've got to do is ensure that, you're, that there's, there's reward uh, for investing in fibre um, fiber networks. And that largely means ensuring that if, you, if that investment happens, that, you know, that, 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 that upgrades in the copper network are, are not put in and so basically remove your customer base. It's called overbuild in the, in the cloud. <coughs> but that basically means that you need some kind of regulated environment that rewards investment in the new technologies um, and it means that you can't be undermined by basically an upgrade of, of, of the old, and that largely means around pricing. Um, so, so that needs to be looked at, because clearly what you don't want to do is, is as, these, as, as, as investment goes in, is the case to be uh, skewed because of, of, of various commercial decisions taken really uh, in, you know, in, in, in terms of not reaching the ultimate objective, which I remember is fiber, full fibre to the premise, which is the government's policy. So I think that's the key thing. Overbuild is, as we would call it, technically, is, is something that needs to be looked at now. Uh, and then one thing. And then if I turn to um, if I turn to rural, um, well, I think there's there's obviously the broadband USO that's that's um, um, being introduced. Um, our view on that is at the moment the government wanted to be paid for. Well, there's two options. Basically, they have a consultation on an option, which I don't know if they're going to do, but they have a consultation, on it, and they also have a BT offer, which we haven't seen the full details of. I think whatever happens, we need to make sure that any money raised doesn't get in the way of some of the good work that's been done in rural areas to roll out fibre to the premise, which companies like GigaClear, I don't think you're here today, um, are doing. And that, again, is this overbuilt point. So they need to make sure that investment is rewarded, as well as obviously delivering the, the USO, which we do support, which is obviously a minimum 10, 10 megabytes uh, to, each, to each home. Um, uh, so I think that's important. And then I think increasingly we would also like to explore really how mobile can play a part in, in that delivery as well. The challenge we have with that is, is commercially it's quite difficult as a product today, but we have done it in other countries. Um, so, so I think there's also as a technology that might be something that could come into play, but, but as I say at the moment it's quite difficult because of the commercial realities of, of that. And basically I think the key, key point is that we need to... We need to get moving. Uh, we have some good news coming, but we need to make sure that if we do this event next year, we can we we we've started to at least have ambitions to be way above the two percent figure and catching up with our key competitors in Europe who are now twenty five percent. And welcome to Damien. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul is just finished it, Sarah, and then Damien will. Okay, lovely. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to say thank you to TPS and Vodafone for inviting me here today. Um, I don't think I can probably paint such a positive picture as, the, <laughs> as Paul and the others. I'm going to you know, talk about it from the perspective of the rural community and that those on the ground and the, the frustrations that they, they still have. And I 
So I'd like to start saying I hope you'll agree with me today that you know the countryside is, is a national treasure, it's admired around the world for its beauty, but it's also a home and a workplace for millions of Britons. And those who live and work there can often be forgiven for feeling that the countryside is often treated as a theme park and doesn't receive the political support and action that it, that it deserves. It's clear um, that Brexit will be front and centre of the work of this parliament and the decision to leave the EU will have a profound impact on the countryside. But the rollout of broadband and the countryside continue to be a contentious issue facing the government. Um, as these guys outlined earlier, you know, 12% of our GDP is generated through the internet, which is significantly ahead of other countries. You know, Britain is leading the way on the digital economy, which is why it's so frustrating that countries are lagging so far behind when it comes to connectivity. We have our members and other rural communities telling us they believe digital connectivity is crucial to life in the 21st century, but yet they know full well that compared to their urban areas, the service they put up with is often dire, making it impossible to complete basic tasks, let alone run a business. I mean, we've all been there, checking our routers, um, looking at the unblinking data, not really working for us. It's just not acceptable. And, you know, we've come to a situation where it would be unthinkable, and rightly so, to council us cutting off water or electricity to isolated communities, but failing to roll out broadband and mobile phone connectivity is apparently perfectly politically acceptable. It shouldn't be. For those in Whitehall to treat digital connectivity even as an optional extra, it shows a shockingly lazy metropolitan attitude. You know, it should be a simple fact of life for guys living out there. In a recent report published by Ofcom, we were told that just under one million <coughs> homes in the countryside receive speeds, um, are unable to receive, receive speeds above 10 megabytes per second, and one in five are unable to receive speed, speeds above five. You know, Ofcom also telling us that 10 megabytes is a perfectly acceptable what we should be aiming for. You know, we are in a situation where 5% of the country do not get anything. It's just unacceptable. Um, for years, we've had, until a few months ago, we had a BT had a de facto monopoly. Um, and the CPS themselves noted last year that it was anti-competitive and stifled the free market. In March this year, we, BT and OPE begin to separate. And, you know, hopefully this will see a positive rollout of broadband, enable them a focus on delivering in the countryside. But we don't want to be distracted by their separation. Um, the government has an ambition to have as many services online as possible. And we applaud this ambition. So as accessing these services becomes an everyday essential for people, it needs to be matched by connectivity. And this is particularly pertinent in the countryside. In many cases where rural people already find it difficult to access services due to poor public transport, um, cost of driving, and all the usual aspects, um, the ability to use these services online has the potential to make their lives so much easier. But this depends on acceptable internet speeds. And it's widely acknowledged that improving rural broadband would have a disproportionately positive impact on rural people's lives. Um, and we're talking here today talking about Gigabit Britain. And, you know, we welcome that. It's, you know, we love to see ambition. But without simultaneous improvements in the rural areas, we risk not only leaving, um, increasing the rural urban divide on uh, broadband speeds, but also creating social issues. The campaign to end loneliness um, identified the lack of access to fast broadband in rural areas as a key obstacle in preventing loneliness, particularly in um, the elderly community, which we know in rural areas we have a disproportionate number of. So we need to you know, bridge this gap and make it work for us. Um, Gigabit Britain, how positive, great, but will allow, and will allow people to set their own companies from home, encourage entrepreneurs, um, is vital for many tech-based industries. But those without sufficient internet speeds can, cannot be expected to play a full role in the modern world, and their communities will suffer. At a time when Brexit, Britain is leaving the EU, we must ensure Britain is globally competitive in the post-Brexit world, and this will not be the case we must invest in better broadband. We recognise, and I think there's been some positive news over the, um, moves over the last few years, that the government has a really ambitious broadband policy, but as ever, we're concerned about delivery and over-promising, which ultimately fails to meet the demand of consumers and businesses. And the current drive for Gigabit Britain risks the digital divide getting even bigger. The ability to introduce the USO could go some way of bridging the gap, but will it be fit for purpose? Is it going to be responsive to user needs? Is it going to be future-proofed in line with new technologies? If not, it will never provide the speeds that urban Britain is being offered, and it's just simply unfair to them. So what can the government do to meet its digital ambitions? We will continue to review a broadband policy to make sure it's fit for purpose, including measures to include more competitive packages in the business and the domestic market, we need to ensure that, you know, even by the end of next year, or 2019, we have, you know, we have a minimum of 15 megabytes per person, sorry, per bit, seconds, for premises. We need to ensure that there's a priority of rolling out fibre optic to business parks and enterprise zones to ensure our urban and rural businesses can compete. We also need to really identify where those communities are who have, have got broadband, poor broadband connectivity. We know from BD UK it's patchy, no one knows where it's going to be, what's going on, and we, we need an honest map of who's got poor broadband, what can we do to, to deliver on that? 
We also want to know to strike an important strike a balance between quantity and quality and ensuring that adequate provision of broadband to all, not just the 95%, is prioritised above ever increased speeds in urban areas. It, the best use of this, this is the best use of scarce resources, and without doing so, is likely to um, leave rural areas behind, which will cause social disruption and economic harm. So where we're coming from, fundamentally, from, from the countryside lands and, and from the countryside, we are massively ambitious for rural Britain. We're told constantly that from farmers, their smartphones and broadband connectivity is changing the way they farm. We're told, we're, we, know, we know there's more entrepreneurs in rural areas, there's more small businesses in rural areas, but these guys need the broadband to go with it. So we almost all work together to ensure that we have super fast broadband. We need a market which is fair, drives innovation, is transparent to ensure we can all be part of this revolution. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Is there one... European country where rural broadband is particularly um, widespread, and are there any sort of policy lessons? That I think when we start looking at the Nordic countries, they're very good at yeah. <laughs> uh, rolling out all kind, all kind of technologies, and I think you know, there's always the saying, well, actually, they've got different landscapes, so it's easy for them to roll it out, but it, it I think fundamentally comes down to investment and will, and I think that, you know, we, we're slightly lacking that. We, we talk a good game, but we don't always follow through. Bim. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, just following that last point, I mean, I think um, Spain is quite an interesting country to look at as well. They have very um, almost complete penetration of fibre to the premises, actually, in Spain, uh, which is a different model than we've, we've gone, gone down here, and it's been very effective. Again, I think the climate and the, uh, has, helped, has helped that roll out, but um, I think that is a really interesting model. The Select Committee looked at that when we, when we visited Spain um, uh, earlier in the year as part of our Brexit inquiry. Um, I mean, other countries that are... There are other countries that do have good penetration levels. You often tend to find that, that people in those countries, like New Zealand, for example, that most of the, most a disproportionate number of the population live in live in one very small, small bit of the country. So it's quite easy to hit sort of quite high levels of penetration when everyone's in the same place. So um, I mean, the, the the big change with the, since um, um, the Select Committee launched an inquiry uh, into broadband broadband delivery, uh, which we reported on uh, about eighteen months ago, and there were a number of things that we were concerned about there. Firstly, was the um, the structure of BT and Open Reach, and therefore that there should be an effective structural separation you know, uh, to allow Open Reach to make investment decisions based on its view of what the need was and what the priorities were, rather than that being owned to be influenced by the the retail policy of the, of, the, of, what, of an individual company. And to set up that Open Reach runs the network and it builds the network and invests in the network, not just for BT but on behalf of lots of other companies too. And so we thought that level of structural separation was really important. Uh, we also felt that, um, that BT Group should be doing a lot better in terms of investing in customer service and being responsive. I think we'll all have the experience, and I speak as a BT customer myself, uh, that uh, if you phone up um, to complain about your broadband speed, it's often quite difficult to get um, hold of someone on the phone. If you're phoning up to a great BT Infinity, you speak to someone straight away. So, uh, <laughs> so, so there's some frustration about the, the, their, the way they prioritise customer complaint and response to it. Uh, and we also felt that they should be spending more investing more in the rollout of, of superfast broadband itself as well. But it is incredibly frustrating uh, if you live in a, in a rural area. I know, um, as I do, and um, I've dealt with many constituents, almost every member of parliament uh, has who have concerns about the fact they don't get the broadband speeds that they want, and particularly when uh, broadband is being delivered through the upgrading of cabinets, fibre to the cabinet, uh, and then copper wire to your, to your home. Um, some people some people are connected to a cabinet that's not necessarily the one they think they are. So it's very frustrating when you're told your postcode area has been upgraded, but it doesn't include your property because actually your supply comes from a different cabinet that hasn't been upgraded. Now, of course, the reason why um, rural broadband coverage is patchy is because it's more expensive to do because there are fewer customers there to use it, but it can be done very successfully. In fact, there are many fibre to the home um, uh, 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 deliveries of, uh, in villages and rural areas where com companies separate from open reach have gone in, they've put fibre connections to the home, they can make an economic case to do it, and it works really well. I think what we should be looking in those gap areas is actually greater transparency from open reach over where they are and aren't going to go, and the, and the level of service they can provide or not. Because often what stops another provider coming in is the uncertainty that that, that, that investment will be built over by open reach at some point in the future, and therefore they won't get the return for the investment they've put in. So I think you know, being sensible about that in the, in the not spot areas or the, or the areas of very, very poor delivery to try and encourage a market solution where other providers might come in with some certainty that they will be able to run that service for a period of time to at least pay back their investment. I think that level of transparency would be helpful. Um, it, uh, OpenReach always push back on that saying, you know, it's, it's unfair, we shouldn't have to disclose where we're going or not going. 
Uh, but I think when we're talking about the areas, the few areas of the country where they, they don't believe the economic case has been there to make a be bigger or better investment, then, then why not allow someone else to come in with some degree of certainty that they can invest? Um, the USO is, is really important. I mean, the government is, uh, you know, has been consulting on the USO. It has a proposal from BT to deliver the USO. So that's, that's minimum speed, 10 megabits per second minimum speed, but as a right for every home in the country. So that broadband is, is put on a par with, uh, with uh, other utilities and particularly the Royal Mail. The Royal Mail is a good example. You know, the cost of uh, sending a first class uh, letter is the same wherever you send it to in the country, whether that's somewhere it's very cheap to deliver it to or very expensive to deliver it to. So it puts broadband on the same level. Everyone will have the right to request the service and it'll be delivered and the cost for delivery uh, is being absorbed by the industry itself. So the government is consulting on, on a proposal for BT to deliver it. We'll, as a committee, I'm sure we'll have a detailed look at that to make sure it's the best one for the consumer. But I think that's an important step forward. The, the government have also changed some of the rules and regulations regarding the, the, the creation of digital infrastructure. Sometimes what's been quite frustrating is landowners suddenly charging very high costs to put pieces of communications, communications infrastructure on their land, be it building, a, you know, creating a new duct for pipes uh, to carry um, broadband cables or whether it is a mobile phone mast or whatever it is. There's often quite a lot of frustration about those costs. Well, the, in changing the code, the government of have taken out all of those cost elements and, and preventing landlords from you know, effectively ransom charges to enable the rollout of infrastructure where we want it. So it's a technical change, but one that I think is, is quite important and will be quite welcome too. Uh, the other thing I think is increasing, I personally think is increasingly important in, in uh, rural areas because I think the rollout of super fast broadband is starting to reach more people. But one of the, the um, bigger complaints I still get is about mobile coverage too. Uh, and that, that is often patchy and poor. The government has said that. Um, he wants to look at a, delivering a, the idea of a universal service obligation for 3G mobile signals. Uh, I mean, Ofcom have been investigating too that they think actually the, the real level of service for mobiles, mobile phones is, is much worse than is actually officially stated by the companies. That there are areas which uh, are considered to be geographically covered, but particularly in rural areas because of hills and, uh, and other features which block signals, uh, the signal take up is much lower. And Ofcom also want the the service delivery to include the reception people get within their within their homes and not just on the street in the areas where they live. So I think again, if the mobile operators are not reaching the level of penetration that they're supposed to under the licences, and that the real level is much lower, then Ofcom can take action against them. And I think that's the right approach to take because we do need, I think, at least you know, whilst people increasingly want to stream video content and do all, all, all other sorts of data-rich things on a mobile device. I think we should have a network which at least enables people to make phone calls, voice calls, wherever they are uh, in the country, and, and we're not quite at that level yet. And of course, one of the exciting things for the future, I don't know if you spoke about this earlier, is of course 5G, you know, which requires a massive investment in the fibre network to allow it to be delivered, but is a, mobile, but is a, but a, sig a signal-based service. And it may well be that ultimately the solution to people in rural areas getting you know, genuinely very strong areas of um, Getting, getting very high levels of performance will be through 5G signals uh, being delivered off a fibre network. Uh, but of course, you know, the issues are not um, not just in rural areas, but in urban, urban ones too, you know, where the level where the level of demand is is enormous, and meeting that demand and the demand for data is something that, that, that people have struggled with. There are as many you know problems in Soho as there are in Suffolk you know, in that in that regard, you know, because because of those not spot areas. And, and it's and it's really important we get those things right because where you look at you know particularly successful hubs for businesses that work in the media and the creative economy where access to some rich data services at low cost is really important. Parts of the country where they've put those, those, those systems in are doing really well. In fact, here in Manchester is a really great example. There's the, the Sharp project in Manchester, the studio business, video games, um, other tech businesses there. The foundation stone for that project, and it being where it is, is it has a massive fat pipe of cheap, of, you know, which is cheap, you know, uh, and people plug into that. So it's you know, it's it's a great, it's a it's a re the, and businesses are built off simply off the back of having access to that to that service and they build from it. Again, you look at Titanic Studios, Titanic Water in Belfast as well. It is it is it's access to the transatlantic you know, data pipe uh, and be able to run business and innovation through it that has made that succeed. So in cities and urban areas, uh, the, the, there's no doubt that whilst you know, we have the right skills, the right people. Uh, the right creative thinking, it is just access to the physical infrastructure that supports these businesses, that makes those areas succeed. Um, you know, we should be looking at how we can have more of those around the country. Thank you. Uh, on, on the separation of um, Openreach and uh, uh, BT, 
the structural separation that's gone, gone, mm. gone through now, is that something which needs to be watched uh, for full, um, full legal separation considered, or do you think this goes far enough? Um, no, it, it does. It does need to be watched because I think we need to. I think we need to look at is open, does, is open reach treating all its customers in the same way? It's business company. You know, it's, so is the, is the level of service it, it supplies to um, Talk Talk and Sky, uh, for example, the same as it offers to um, BT Retail? Uh, also, is on, on fibre as well. I mean, this is an issue the other companies have raised in the past. Is to say that um, the um, cost of fibre has been set quite high. It's not regulated and it's been quite high. Uh, but for open reach, that's you know, BT is not so much a problem because you know, the uh, BT retailer is paying the same high price, but to open reach, and does that mean that they can churn the money back through the business? Whereas other companies are, are stuck with with having to pay a very high price of fibre for their customers and making virtually their money on top of it as well. So I think we have to make sure that there are like, anti-competitive things that open reach can do, which still massively pay the BT retail over other suppliers. What what we you know, in some ways you know I think it's very easy to bash BT because they're the ones who are delivering the network. Uh, but they've but they've also done it, you know. So um, and what were, what I think everyone would have wanted, certainly with the BD UK rollout, was lots of suppliers. You know, you want a, you want a busy active market. CPS will understand this very well. You don't want markets dominated by one player because they're not efficient markets. Uh, and that's what we've that's what we've ended up with. Partly because BT were the only company with the scale to deliver it. But there are lots of other willing entrants as well. So I think in in this, if you like this last stop before actual total separation for open reach. I think we need to monitor carefully to make sure it is supporting the market and all the players in it so we have a, a healthy, vibrant market with lots of players, with lots of players, not one that's, that, is, that is increasingly dominated just by one. We would agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, some questions from the floor. Uh, yes. I will have to um, acknowledge being the open reach person in the room. That's all right. So, <laughs> if that's okay, can I just respond to a couple of things of very quickly and then ask a question? So, I'm Catherine Collins. I'm the director of corporate affairs at Open Reach. New into Open Reach. I'm not from BT, um, and came in as part of the drive to try and, as our chairman talks about it, build a 5.2 billion dollar startup and sort of try and put some structures in to make sure that we can do all the things you're talking about. So, the first thing I just want to say is. We do not treat any customer in any different way. And we never have historically, and I know I'm new in, but genuinely historically, we treat absolutely every single customer in exactly the same way. We treat Talk Talk and Sky and Vodafone with the utmost respect as huge customers. So I just want to sort of reassure people that's how we treat all our customers. I just want to pick up on the, the UBC point as well in terms of the offer. The offer is actually a BT group offer, but we're obviously delivering on the fixed access part of the UBC, should that be accepted by government. So we see the 10 meg as a flaw. I know there's been a lot of debate about, is 10 meg enough? Is that going to be future-proofed? We absolutely will try and get more than 10 meg to as many people as possible. And interesting, if you think about rural areas, we are now, not least through BD UK, deploying a far greater proportion of full fibre to rural areas. Because actually accessing rural areas is quite difficult, and the copper technology doesn't work as well over distance, as we all know. So actually a lot of the stuff, a lot of the BD UK contracts, some of the contracts we've just signed, um, in Cornwall, in Devon and Somerset, they're 100% full fibre. And certainly our intention, depending on whether that offer is accepted, and one of the sort of structures of the offer that certainly has open reach we would prefer, is a greater proportion of full fibre in any UBC rollout. So we absolutely want to do full fibre. Which sort of comes to my last point and then the question. So we are, as open reach, fully committed to a full fibre gigabit future. Now, we think there needs to be transition technologies because full fibre, as we all know, is complex, takes a long time to roll out. So the 10 million by 2025 that Matt Hancock talks about, as you say, all, all the numbers that Mark mentioned that you add up together, you're still talking about that potentially has overbuild as well. You're still talking about quite a lot of people who don't have access to full fibre in a generation. It's, it's a massive, big national infrastructure project, which is why I think we all need to work more collaboratively in how we deliver that. But because it's a long project, we do have interim technologies which will get people onto fast speeds. But we are absolutely committed to working out how we build big full fibre platforms, which is why we're doing the consultation with customers to see whether we can do it. The question is around one of the big questions that we've raised in the consultation, um, which is we are a wholesaler. So we effectively build the network, um, but we build the network for our retailers. And so, therefore, what we do is driven to a certain extent by commercial demand from an end customer and an end customer telling a retailer what they want. 
we don't currently have customers, either end customers or retailers, coming and saying, build us loads of fill fibre. And the reason is that it's not, it's not for the reasons... I mean, we all know full fibre is better. <laughs> it's got better latency, it's future-proof, it's the right network. And if you're a network business, that's the right network to build for future-proofing. Um, but in terms of speed, customers can get away, quite frankly, with 30 to 40 meg for the foreseeable future. That will basically stream you several things over the house, do your homework... Um, it, it, it's, it, I know, I know I'm, I'm looking at Sarah going, 30 meg, you'd be absolutely in dreamland if you had 30 meg, but, but that does work for people. So the, the question I sort of have to people is, how do you get over this, and it's one of the big things in the consultation, this hummock of demand and stimulating, if you like, demand and education with an end customer base to ensure that it's not just gigabit of building because it's the, sorry, gigaclear building because it's the only option, but actually people are saying, this is what we want. We understand what it enables and it'll allow our fridge to talk to our car and therefore help drive the overall market and helps that broader business case for us in investing in full fibre. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, two, two, two points I want to, to address there. One is a pricing, pricing point. So I think pricing is important. Um, in the UK, we um, in some ways have the benefit of, of amongst the lowest broadband pricing in Europe. We also have the lowest rollout of digital infrastructure compared to Europe, and there is a correlation. So, um, so driving pricing low, um, and I say this, Damien, for your point around the, 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 some of the challenges around is, is the open reach fibre price too high, and should it be lower? But the real reality, if you keep driving it lower, you get to a point where no one wants to invest the business case for investment in that fibre, becomes even more challenging. So I think that there's a, there's a point there around getting the right balance between Pricing at a wholesale level, which enables ourselves, OpenReach, to invest and get a return in the infrastructure with the right kind of you know commercial models for the for the researchers to take competitive services out to their end users. And I think there is a danger um, with certain service providers driving towards very low pricing, which which get them trapped into basic broadband services. Uh, a, a large number of TalkTalks customers are still on basic DSL services, not even on superfast services just because of the wholesale price point, they can buy copper from Openridge. So, so that's an important issue to kind of take, in, take into consideration. On the demand side, Caroline's kind of, kind of a, um, a question on, on uh, demand. If you look at um, the, the, the work that we've done working with Sky and TalkTalk Talk in York and putting a new infrastructure in place, and as that infrastructure has been deployed, one of the benefits of doing a new full fibre deployment is you have to be disruptive. There's no way around that. You have to create an element of construction. You have to dig the roads. And that provides an opportunity to engage with the community. Why are you doing that project? What are the benefits of the new full fibre infrastructure that's going to be coming to the homes and to the doorsteps of those residents? And in that way, you get community interest um, early in a project. And when we've come out of, of, of that construction trial process with 40% um, take up of subscribers on the early cabinets that have been deployed. On average across that in an 18 month period now, uh, over 30% of all subscribers. Now, that's working with two retail service providers and if we're at 40% penetration in those on two retail service providers, that's pretty much all of their customers have seen the benefit of migrating onto a full fiber platform. And it's not necessarily just about speed. If we look at the services that, that are being provided across that full fibre infrastructure, they're ranging from 100 megabit services up to gigabit services. Um, but Sky, for example, has um, created retail propositions that guarantee symmetrical 100 megabit services. They know they can do that because they're delivering it over a gigabit capable variance. They can put a guaranteed proposition, guaranteed speed proposition to their users. And that might be seen by some customers as being more beneficial than an up to one gig service. So we're seeing if it's positioned right and with the engagement with the community that actually the demand is there. I think if, if GigaClear were in the room and the work they do with the local communities that they build to, in the rural environment they say exactly the same thing. They get very high take up of the rate <coughs> of where they're kind of, kind of building. So I think that, that's, that's key. I think we can see 
you know, some of this comes also, also down to engagement with local authorities and local authority choices. You know, Gloucestershire, for example, has opted to go a full fibre route in its Fastershire project, and it has, you know, clear, clear deploying across the villages of, of Gloucestershire. Residents are taking very cost-effective one gigabit services, and what we're doing in the urban environment is demonstrating very, very similar kind of results. One thing, though, coming back, there is, there is some joined-up thinking that's needed in government. Um, so whilst we have, you know, a digital minister sitting within, you know, the, the DCMS or the new DDCMS, I think, as it's now called, the Digital Culture, Media and Sports, um, and within DCMS there's a barrier busting team. But I would say that as, as fast as the barriers are being busted, there are new barriers being put up in other parts of government. So there needs to be a greater degree of joined up thinking. And I wanted to give one particular example of this, which is, um, you know, the, the highways, um, you know, Department of Transport, looking at uh, the possibility of introducing a lane tax for uh, utility builders to close roads. Could be up to, you know, two, two, two and a half thousand pounds per hour for road closures to build utility networks. That would be a substantial barrier to anybody. So there needs to be at some way at a government level looking at some of these policies as how we create greater joined up thinking across government to ensure that actually we're not putting up artificial barriers which are going to um, resist that. I know I was actually participating in a panel yesterday with, with Open Reach and they raised business rates and wage leaves and all the other issues. But there's quite a lot of kind of red tape stuff that needs to be kind of addressed, shall we say, to make the investment flow quite smoothly. Um, well, I don't think Mark's handled that question. I, look, I, I mean, I think we've, we've all welcomed uh, the statements coming out of Open Reach. I think we, we will continue to challenge uh, on, this, on this equality point. Um, just for people to understand, there's what 500 plus customers of, of Open Reach, if they're not, uh, we all use. So we, 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 you know, we use Open Reach Connect our mobile mask, but also to deliver our broadband product. Um, I, we still believe there's, a, there's an issue of competition. We want to see competition. I think it would be good for Open Reach actually to have more competition. Mm -hmm. I think there is this balance about you know how much you know how much improvements in the, the copper net, you know infrastructure could potentially skew the investment case for fibre. So I think we do need to look at that. And then I'll just give two examples um, where you know I, I think we just need to judge legal separation on its outcomes. Firstly, we've been asking for a dark fibre product. We were looking at that in London. Um, Ofcom basically lost the legal case on it on the start fire product, um, uh, and and that that you know our, our, our talks on that fell away with Open Reach. Now the point was the, the regulation wasn't covered in London, so there's no reason to cancel it. So I think the reality is you know we want to sort of see action there. And the other thing is this USO um, uh, uh, proposal that's gone into government, and we're a customer of Open Reach. We will end up having to probably pay a little bit of it over the wholesale. Uh, local access market review is potentially part of that. We have not seen that proposal, uh, and I think we should see that proposal. If I'm honest, I mean, I don't know how much we can be published, but we just haven't seen it. I mean, we've seen a press release. So, so I'm, you know, I'm not. I mean, I think you know, we are. You know, I mean, if anybody's judged the things I said a year or two years ago about, you know, we are trying and thinking about being collegiate, but we need to see action on that as well. I want to put a point about the open reach, um, the BT offer, and the consultation which closes at the end of this week. You know, I agree, we, we don't know what the offer really is, we've seen a press release, we don't know much detail, and us as rural lobbyists, I know my colleagues at NFU and CLA, are being put into pressure by, from DCMS to make a decision about which one we think is a good idea, and it's like, we can't make a decision because we don't know what's on offer, and that, that you know, they want this really answer in the next few days, end of next week, and so we're feeling a bit of a rock and a hard place of where to go. Well, I, I think it's... Um uh, I'm glad you mentioned that the, the consultation because I know Sky have made the same complaint as well that the Openreach didn't, didn't, didn't consult them about the offer. They put there's a BT Group offer. You know, Openreach is delivering. They deliver on behalf of all of their customers, but they've only probably spoken to one of their customers about about it. You know, so you know, and that's why the, these questions are there. I think we all you know, we all will support the separate the, the structural separation of the, of the businesses, but but actually what we want to see is that. Um, you know, I said we want to see. We want to see. In the, I think in the future more players actively in the market. You know, we want to see more of the, the sort of the, the work that was done at York with companies like with Sky and Talk Talk investing in, in uh, investing in the network as well as it just being done through Open Reach. Well, what, I don't think I, what I want to see is that you know we go through the the kind of the final upgrade of the copper network and then at some point in the future there's a fibre network. But, but Open Reach is setting the pace, controlling that all the way along the line. I think what will be interesting in the future is how do you certainly think of a five G future? How do you 
how do you enable, like, when we have multiple fiber networks, how do they come together? You know, and how, how is that done? And I think the point, the point on, on the price, I mean, I think I, I, I do appreciate the point that you've got to have a, a wholesale price that makes it worth investing in the network. And we want to encourage people to invest more. But I think the, the concern that was raised by, um, by you know, some of the, the retail players was that if the, if, the, if the wholesale price is very high, and then but with a tiny retail margin on top, you know, that's only sustainable for enough for some people. You know, particularly, you know, it's particularly sustainable for BT and Open Reach, but not for other people as well. And there was concern that it was that that margin being so small was choking off other potential investors or not. But I think one of the things I think Ofcom should lead lead in the discussion is Ofcom on the whole with broadband have sought to keep prices low to you know, to please the retail market. You know, to, to pe people that have broadband services at, at low cost, and that's great. But there is a trade-off between the price you pay and the investment, the, the reinvestment back in the network. So it might be interesting to have a different dialogue with consumers to say, if, if, if you paid a little bit more, but you, you could be guaranteed that the network would be a lot, lot better, is that, would, is that what you want? You know, that should be part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Philip Virgo, I'll declare an interest, but the interest actually helps explain the question. I'm a shareholder in BT, I'm a shareholder in Vodafone, I'm a shareholder in City Fiber. <laughs> Over half the cost and half nice the time of your spend on upgrading and improving your networks is taken up with access, waylies, negotiating with highways departments, and all of that kind of gubbing. <coughs> Even when and I understand that a number of you, you give priority to those local authorities who work to pull everything together to cut time and cost. But many of them are then sabotaged by the fact that they have outsourced their highways department's administration to Capita. They've outsourced the access and way leaves to somebody else. And all of their outsourcers are on a per item fee charge and a consequence of the outsourcing of the functions in local government that you're dealing with is a massive overhead on your costs when you're trying to roll out new networks, upgrade existing networks. Mm. I've no idea how it's done, but how do you actually come together to give evidence to a certain select committee that might try to work with other select committees to... Um, actually help remove some of these barriers which massively increase the cost, massively increase the time taken, <coughs> and I'm not sure who they benefit other than per item paid middlemen and outsource contractors. Very good. So, look, I mean, Philip, you're right, and we've talked about this over a number of years. I think what is certainly the case is, is that there's more focus on traditional infrastructure and the ability to build upgrade that infrastructure that has been historically on the digital infrastructure. I think at the, at the level that Mark described, at the, at the level of ministerial statement, we are moving on from that. I think what we now need to do is actually change the, 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 basically the policy and the regulation. And so they have made in our world some improvements to planning, for example, but you're right, it takes too, too long to do it. You know, it's not, you know, I mean, there's contradictions in, in some of the policies you know, I mean, if you look at house building, for example, that's not, you know, it's the connectivity is added on at the end as an afterthought. It's seen as quite often as being a revenue raiser, you know, and we just don't quite have it right. I mean, at the moment, we just don't have it right at all. And I think the trouble is that it's still seen as a sort of add-on, not, you know, nice to have, shall we say, and, and a way of raising money, basically, and across the board. So, that, you know, and I think that's the problem. I think with planning, for example, you know, it, I mean, you know, it's probably rightly, it's not seen as important to their housing estate in terms of planning, so you know it can get shoved in the corner, and, and also planning authorities have, for example, been a little bit hollowed out as well. Uh, so it's all of these things matter in, in the great scheme of things, but I think you're right, what the government needs to do is recognise that, as they have done, frankly, with Crossrail, where they had legislation in Parliament, where they have, you know, with uh, nuclear power, again, I think, you know, they've, they've certainly had a focus on it, um, you know, and all these other areas where they've actually focused and, and, had, and brought political will to hard decisions, uh, I would suggest that we've got a long way to go on digital infrastructure to get that sort of focus. Although, frankly, we have calls on us to deliver it, and rightly so. But you know, we, from our point of view, what we need from government and policymakers and parliament is probably you know the ability to actually drive forward some of this policy change, even when some people frankly will complain. 
Um, just take one last question from the gentleman with the lights. Yeah, it's Adam Gibbs on Sky. Um, yeah, I mean, it might not be that quick actually, but <laughs> it, it's just this intersection between uh, the, the discussion we were just having about the wholesale price of the regulated product and what, where that's set and the USO. Um, you know, the government set out to have a USO in a, in a transparent, careful way, and yet what we're, what we're end, end, ending up with is some sort of voluntary deal with uncertainty over what's going to happen to the regulated prices and it will only it feels like it will only compound the problem of regulated prices being in the wrong place in and it and it lacks accountability. Is is that a problem? It could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and that, and it's, you know, it's the right question to be asking. And I think we have to you know I think what we have to avoid I think we have to look very carefully at the USA proposal <clears throat> and ensure that it is the you know Everyone wills the end. It's very tempting. Say someone's come along and said, "Okay, that's what you've promised to do." USA by 2020. This is how we will do it for you. It's quite attractive. You know? So, but in the long run, is that the best deal for the consumer? And that's the that, uh, uh, that's the that's the test we have to make, both in the short term, in terms of the cost of delivery, the speed of delivery, but in the long term, thinking about what, you know, what what does the market look like if we do it in that way. I mean, on USA, I mean, you know, we, we, we totally agree that this is now not a nice to have, I just said. Um, I, I think we we have some frustration, um, and Adam might want to jump in because he's also a big customer of Overreach, but we have some frustration that, frankly, this hasn't been done already, and that we're expected to pay extra for it. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we've done some research with Frontier, an economic consultancy, who, who have estimated that, that BT has made you know, over £10 billion. Pounds over the last 10 years, excess profit based on regulated prices. So, you know, and that's not to say they're full, I mean, but the reality is that, you know, that, that's what we've estimated. There's a debate about it, but certainly it seems to be that it's, it's over estimated. We thought that that could be basically invested. And we're still today not clear um, about where the BDUK network will be built to and end, so we don't know what the gap is. And so all of this seems to be, you know, we don't want to make the same mistakes made with BDUK for reasons that you mm. highlight, you know, it wasn't really much choice. But, you know, we need to know where that is, right? And then we need to judge that it's properly spent, that money, and, you know, that it's been used really not, not, you know, basically just to upgrade the network, not for the running cost of that network, you know, minus the profit made on that network from, for customers of BT. So, you know, there's a number of things that need to be done that we don't make the same mistakes that we made before with BDUK. And we seem to be quite a long way from that at the moment. Mm. Thank you very much indeed uh, to all our speakers. It's clearly a very fast-moving world. Um, just in the, as uh, Sarah was saying, just in the last year, it's extraordinary the changes in, in broadband provision. Uh, but there's also actually um, a considerable distance to travel. But uh, can you join me in thanking the members of the panel? Thank you very much.